Well, hello there. Welcome to the Pacific War Channel, the channel where we cover the Asia-Pacific War of 1937 to 1945 and all the major events that led up to it. Now, because of over 250 comments and rising over a mildly popular video I put out on the Battle of Midway, I really wanted to come back and talk about this battle. More specifically, I wanted to talk about a major issue that occurred during this battle that is notoriously known as the Nagumo Dilemma. So things went wrong for both the IGN and the US Navy during this battle, and it's actually quite incredible how the turn of fate spun back and forth for them. But one thing is for sure, whether you ask a Japanese or American war scholar today, they will always bring up Nagumo's Dilemma as one of the most crucial blunders that lost the Battle of Midway. Now, if you have not already seen my, well, poorly narrated but arguably well animated video on the Battle of Midway, you could click on the card above. It, you know, went into a very detailed minute-by-minute -minute look at the battle, and I do argue you should watch it. Uh, it's kind of a precursor to this one. And for those who commented on my terrible narration skills when I made that video and the hilarious dyslexic mistake I made when I called B-25 Mitchell Bombers B-52s, I'm very sorry. It was even written on the script, B-25, and I've done this already three times as we're filming and made that error again and again and again, and I guess I have some dyslexic problem. Also, the other errors I made in my, my narration, I will go through them at the end of this video so you can get your just dessert after. Uh, so let's dive right in, shall we? After the Pacific War, the Japanese were trying to understand why their admirals acted in the way they did during the disaster that was the Battle of Midway. One of the many conclusions they came up with was what they called victory disease. They described this as being an overconfidence the Japanese military felt after so many successful victories, which led the military to make an arrogant and rather foolish decision in the future. The attitude of the IGN led them to complicate the midway battle plan rather needlessly by splitting up their forces. The Battle of Midway was a plan devised primarily by Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, and the core of the plan was to seek out and crush the remaining US Pacific Fleet. This was going to be done by a surprise attack on Midway in order to draw out the US Pacific Fleet, specifically the aircraft carriers, for a decisive battle. During the simulations of Yamamoto's Midway invasion plan, Vice Admiral Chichi Nagumo and his staff foresaw a dilemma. What if the American carriers should enter the battle while the Japanese carrier aircrafts were engaged in bombing Midway? Oh, the foreshadowing of this pure Shakespearean moment. If you look at the list of warships on either side, even disregarding what the Japanese did not know would be there, such as the USS Yorktown, strictly by the numbers, this was going to be a landslide victory for the IGN. On top of the massive numerical advantage, the IGN also knew that their aircrafts were technologically superior, and the US did not at this time possess great aircrafts, not to say that they weren't good, but up against the Zero Fighter, it wasn't looking good for America. Now, so many mistakes were made on both sides during this battle, but it was the US who stole this miraculous victory straight from the hands of the IGN. This battle remains as one of the most studied naval battles in history. So, what were these major mistakes, and what do we mean when we say Nagumo Dilemma? <sighs> Poor Nagumo, his name is going to live in infamy whenever you talk about Midway. So like I was saying about victory disease, Yamamoto decided to split off two out of his eight fleet carriers he had to support a rather unimportant and silly side mission during the Battle of Midway, and that was the Aleutian Island Invasion. Uh, to invade the islands of Attu and Kiska. While this of course would have provided a greater range of operation for the Japanese Empire against the United States, in all honesty it was not worth the effort, especially because it hindered the most important goal of the IGN, and that was to force a decisive battle in the Pacific. If it was successful, Japan would have been the first nation to occupy US soil since the War of 1812. This side mission was also a faint attack, trying to draw some of the American forces away from the large battle that would occur at Midway. This proved to be a disastrous blunder, as US cryptanalysts had partially broken up the IGN JN25B code and had been decoding messages related to the Midway operation. 
Commander Joseph Rochefort and his team at the station Hypo were able to figure out using these codes that the Midway Atoll was the target of the mission known as AF. Rochefort did what would be considered a genius move. He sent an undersea cable message to Midway Base, telling them to broadcast an uncoded radio message stating that the Midway water purification system had broken down. Within 24 hours, the codebreakers picked up the Japanese mission AF was short on water, thus confirming Midway was in fact the target. So the US military knew where the IGN would be more or less and that the Aleutian mission was a faint attack, so no US forces were going to fall for it. The victory disease led an overconfident IGN to push Yamamoto to allow for the splitting of the carrier forces to make this faint attack on the Aleutian Islands. It was unnecessary operation, and when the entire purpose of the Midway battle plan was to force the US Navy into a decisive battle, splitting up the forces like this was a huge mistake. Unfortunately, it was not going to be the only large mistake made. That would fall onto our poor friend, Nagumo. Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo was not as innovative as Yamamoto. Up to the Battle of Midway, Nagumo had a near-perfect record, and he was a very competent, by-the-books officer. When you had superior numbers, and a sound strategy, he performed perfectly. A problem with the by-the-book mentality, however, was when something went wrong, you needed to make a vital decision rather quickly, something our poor friend Nagumo utterly failed to do at Midway. Admiral Yamamoto gave all of his carrier commanders detailed orders on specifically what to do in a range of different situations during the Battle of Midway. Nagumo was a by-the-book, doctrine-abiding officer, and he could easily be counted upon to do exactly what he was told. This was important because during the entire battle, the IJN commanders would be hundreds of miles away under strict radio silence. Nagumo was going to be in command of the Kido Butai, the best carrier fleet in the IJN. The initial invasion of the Midway Island would be carried out and led by the Kido Butai Carrier Force Group. This would neutralize any land-based airfields and sink all the U.S. ships near Midway in a surprise attack. Even if the first wave of bombers and fighters did not knock it out, a second wave could come and finish it off quite easily. Nagumo had over 225 aircraft on his four carriers with an additional 21-0 fighters earmarked to become the garrison squadron for Midway once it was taken. It was assumed that the U.S. would need a minimum of over two days to get to Midway from Pearl Harbor once they had figured out that it was under attack. That gave the Kido Butai two full days to launch two waves of massive coordinated attacks upon the island. By the time the U.S. Navy would arrive, the island would be in Japanese hands and the full force of the entire IGN, including their battleships, would be there to surprise attack and crush them. At 4.30 a.m. on June the 4th, Nagumo's first wave of Aichi Type 99 bombers, VALS, and Nakajima Type 97 Kate with 36 Mitsubishi A6M Zero Fighter escorts went on towards Midway. They were outfitted with 1,760 pound bombs designed to just lay out the island and destroy its defenses. Nagumo was strictly ordered by Yamamoto to hold back half his aircrafts to protect the carrier task force at all times and, if necessary, send a second wave to neutralize Midway. After the first wave had launched, Nagumo ordered all the remaining aircraft to be outfitted with bombs in preparation for a second wave attack, if it was to be needed. Now alongside the first wave, Nagumo also sent out Aichi E-13A scout planes to do a perimeter search. Unbeknownst to the IGN, the US Navy was out there actively looking for the Kido Butai. At 5.34 a.m., Lieutenant Howard Addy, piloting a PBY northwest of Midway, found the Kido Butai and reported in at 6.03 a.m. The aircraft on Midway began scrambling in a frenzy. Some of them on their way to bomb the Kido Butai carriers and the others were preparing to fight Nagumo's first wave that was approaching. Thanks to the codebreakers, the U.S. knew the Kido Butai had at least four carriers with them, and when they found out Nagumo's first wave was flying towards Midway, they had a rough idea of a timetable for when the second wave would be sent. The U.S. Navy calculated the best time to hit the Kido Butai 
would be right as the Kido Batai was recovering the low on fuel first wave that had been sent to Midway. This would be the critical moment to strike at the carriers. Between 7 to 8 a.m., the U.S. Task Force 16 launched its aircraft to hit the Kido Butai. Meanwhile, the first wave began to hammer Midway. The Japanese pilots expected to catch the island completely by surprise, but instead were met with a very awake, heavy ground fire coming at them. They noticed immediately the airfields on Midway were completely empty. The aircrafts had already launched. So the bombers destroyed power plants, aircraft buildings, oil storage, tanks, and other targets that they could. An air unit commander, Joichi Tomonaga, broke the radio silence briefly to send a code to Nagumo, indicating they did immense damage to the island, but a second wave was needed for the land evasion to occur. And this he sent at 7.05 a.m. Now, Nagumo expected this message to come. He did not believe the first wave could neutralize the island, enough for an amphibious assault to occur. As he received the message, the Kido Butai was suddenly attacked by the forces that had launched from Midway just hours earlier. TBF Avengers made a brave attempt to torpedo the IGN carriers, but Zero's fighters pounced on them. The Zero's made quick work of the US aircraft, and the Kido Butai was left unscratched. During this intense scramble, an American B-26 bomber piloted by Lieutenant James Murray was damaged, and he tried to crash it right into Akagi's bridge, barely missing, and instead he cartwheeled into the sea. This experience most likely weighed heavily on Nagumo's determination to launch the second wave on Midway, which would have been in a direct violation of Yamamoto's orders if he did not keep half his aircraft in reserve armed for anti-ship combat. At 7.15 a.m., Nagumo ordered his four carriers to arm the reserve aircraft for a second wave, with bombs designed to hit ground targets. From Nagumo's point of view, he was being forced to keep one of his hands tied behind his back while attacking Midway with just the other hand. Why wait for the first wave to come back when he could prepare in advance? Now here is where we get the famous Nagumo dilemma, that he began with his poor decision to rearm the reserved aircraft for attacking Midway instead of leaving them armed for ship-to-ship -ship operations. The scout planes that had been sent out before had actually been delayed half an hour behind schedule. Petty Officer First Class Amari Yoji, piloting one of the scouts, reported, Sight what appears to be 10 enemy surface units in position bearing 10 degrees, distant 240 miles from Midway. Now, exactly when Nagumo got this report is disputed. In his action report, he wrote that he got it around 8 a.m. The Japanese ra radio message log indicates it was actually at 7.45 a.m. Regardless, one thing is important, is that even though Amari did not say he saw a carrier, Nagumo rightfully assumed that there was a carrier present with these 10 surface ships. Nagumo realized immediately that within a striking distance of 200 miles for his own carrier force, there was a U.S. carrier out there. Now, Nagumo immediately consulted his staff. In a crowded public space, Nagumo, without a doubt, would have preferred to be, you know, retreat somewhere on deck more private to consult his officers. This high pressure and stressful situation forced him to immediately call an order to suspend the current arming of aircraft that did not already have bombs on them yet to be armed with torpedoes instead. This would leave about half of the Kates in the hangar of the Akagi and the Kaga equipped with torpedoes while the rest had fragmentation bombs prepared still for the second wave that would hit Midway. Nagumo panicked. He was well aware of what can happen if you sent your fleet out to attack a target and missed the enemy carrier. You would be counterattacked while defenseless. Nagumo needed to know exactly what ships were out there, and he ordered Amari at 7.47 a.m. to assert exactly what ship types were out there and maintain contact. For a few, preci for few precious minutes, the entire Kido Butai was frozen, waiting for this answer. At 7.48 a.m., another attack wave coming from Midway, consisting of Dauntless SBDs, they bravely tried to dive bomb, but the Zero fighters of the Kido Butai easily destroyed and scattered them. Amari reported back at 8.09 a.m., enemy ship are five cruisers and five destroyers. Nagumo was perplexed. It made no sense for such a force to not have at least one carrier present. Nagumo knew the distance was too far for the U.S. to launch their aircraft, so he did not scramble his reserve planes to strike out. 
At the same time, at 8.14 a.m., B-17 heavy bombers had come from Midway again to attack the Kido Putai. The Zero fighters still up in the air again, frantically defending the Kido Putai for a third time, while the U.S. failed again to hit any of the carriers. Now, between 7.55 and 8.35 a.m., the Kido Butai were attacked three separate times by more than 40 American aircraft, and the Zero fighters were running out of fuel. At 8.20 a.m., Amari reported to Nagumo that he had finally sighted a U.S. carrier. Nagumo had already suspected this the entire time, but nonetheless, this was critical news. Nagumo immediately ordered the arming of all bombers with torpedoes and armor-piercing bombs. The decks of all the carriers became crammed with torpedoes, bombs, and aircraft fuel, forming the perfect powder keg. Nagumo had no more Zero fighters in reserve. All of them were already up in the air and low on fuel, and he would need them to escort the bombers. Now, Nagumo was faced with a great dilemma, i.e. Nagumo's dilemma. This was the moment to launch the ship-killing attack planes he had been hoarding on his hangar decks. The problem was, the new first wave that attacked Midway had returned and was low on fuel desperately needing to land. Nagumo used all four of his carriers to launch planes for the Midway attack. He required all four decks open to recover them. He could not recover the planes and launch simultaneously. During all of this, Rear Admiral Yamaguchi Tamon, who was paying attention to all these reports, said to Nagumo in unsolicited advice with a blinker signal, consider it advisable to launch attack force immediately. Now, Nagumo had two choices. Number one, order the first wave and the Zero fighters to circle the task force, risking them running out of fuel, and send out the ship attacking planes he had on reserve without any fighter escorts. Or, Choice number two, recover the first wave and zero fighters, rearm and refuel them, and dispatch a fully coordinated strike, which was Japanese doctrine. They preferred not to use piecemeal attacks. This would take roughly 45 minutes to recover the aircraft and react to any U.S. counterattacks. Of course, Nagumo could have taken this advice uh, and made a piecemeal strike using Yamaguchi's 36 Val dive bombers, but this was against Japanese war doctrine. Japanese doctrine, like I said, preferred to launch fully constituted strikes. Nagumo only received confirmation of the U.S. carrier at around 8.20 a.m. With the major attacks coming from Midway Island, um, Nagumo went by the books on his choice. So, at 8.35 a.m., Nagumo made his decision to recover the first strike wave and zero fighters and prepare for an all-out coordinated attack on the U.S. carrier, a by-the-books decision based on Japanese doctrine. In reality, this all uh, didn't make much of a difference, because by 8.35 a.m., the USS Hornet and Enterprise had already sent out their aircraft about half an hour earlier, and the Kido Butai had no idea. By 9.20, the Kido Butai would have been capable of sending out its attack, but um, they were interrupted at 9.25 by 15 torpedo bombers from the Hornet, followed by 14 more by Enterprise at 9.30, and 12 more from Yorktown at 10 a.m., followed upon what we all know was the devastation of Midway, which changed the course of history as we know it. In essence, Nagumo's dilemma was two choices in a horrible scenario. Send an immediate attack with the wrong kind of armament, and risk most of your planes running out of fuel and crashing, or wait for your forces to land and ready to fight the enemy as a complete force. The Doctrine won the day, but the IGN certainly did not. So here's a huge recommendation. If you're really interested in the Battle of Midway and something that, you know, goes along the lines of describing every single moment that was crucial to this battle, I have to recommend this book. It is called Shattered Sword, The Untold Story of the Battle of Midway by Jonathan Parshall, Anthony Tolley, and John Lundstrom. This is honestly one of the best books ever written on this battle, and I can't stress enough that it is a must-read if you're interested. You know, I find it really ironic. Uh, it was the Japanese doctrine of not using piecemeals which hindered them during this battle, but it was also the American use of piecemeals which won them this battle. 
it's you know it's like a Shakespearean tragedy in a lot of ways and here I will say it it was Spruance who was the man who decided to throw the piecemeals in question and win this battle and yes I said Spruance I did not say Sprounce which was a narration error on my part in the last episode and I do apologize and I will now go through all the errors I made to appease those of you who had commented and might be watching this episode because I did listen. I had mispronounced Port Moresbury. It's Port Moresby and I'm, I'm very sorry Australia. That was uh, really idiotic on my part. And also, um, when I described the Yorktown being repaired in three days, the way that I had said it in the video was actually, it was in transit from the Battle of Coral Sea going to Pearl Harbor, and then it was repaired. But the way I said it was as if it was repaired in two weeks. I meant the entire transit time, and I understand that uh, listening back to it, it, it sounded like I said the Yorktown was repaired in two weeks. Of course, it was repaired in three days, and you can argue 48 hours, whatever you want to argue, but I, of course, know that was a very important, crucial moment for this war. Other than that, um, obviously I mispronounced Japanese names and I must apologize for doing so. I am currently trying to learn the language and I find it rather challenging, but I am doing my best. So, gomenasai. Again, as I said at the very beginning, um, if you rather want a funny tour, you can go through the comment sections from the last video, if the card is still up at the Battle of Midway, where I'd say the majority of comments all say the exact same thing, and I already acknowledged it in this episode, and that is when I called B-25 Mitchell Bombers B-52s during the Doolittle Raid. I feel so horrible about this. I had written down B-25, but, and even filming this episode, I did it three times in a row for whatever reason. I must have some kind of dyslexic issue. I kept saying B B-52s trying my best and I'm really I do apologize but I hope I will not do it in the future um I like to acknowledge that you might find this actually all very confusing looking at my channel uh because my channel is called the Pacific War of 1937 to 1945 but I seem to be covering a lot of stuff before so if you actually go on my channel now and I'll show you probably here you'll see that I'm covering uh the 1800s particularly uh, Chinese history. So we're looking at the First Opium War, Second Opium War, Taiping Rebellion. We go over to Japan later, the Meiji Restoration, the Boxer Rebellion, you know, the Sino-Japanese War, the First Russo-Japanese War, and a lot of cool things that'll be covered before we get to the actual Pacific War. Because I am honestly treating this uh, more or less like a university course, and I really want to get all the major events and the grievances that led up to the Asia-Pacific War to really educate the audience on all the small details that, particularly us in the Western world, we don't know about. I really hope you'll join me, and if you haven't already done so, could you please smash that like button, leave a comment, even if it's telling me I mispronounced stuff in this episode also, and uh, subscribe if you could, because I'm a small channel and I make history on YouTube, and if you don't know how important possible that is i can't stress enough it is like the worst subject to try and cover you get demonetized like there's no tomorrow that whip just goes every single time and this has been the pacific war channel over and out